welcome to the Explaining History podcast, and today I'm going to talk about the presidential election 1940, when Roosevelt chose to stand for a historic and unprecedented third term. In the last couple of months, I've done a number of podcasts about um, the relationship between Roosevelt and Churchill, and Roosevelt's changing views on intervention in the Second World War, and his desire to offer uh, Britain as much assistance as possible. And this is kind of the context of the election, because obviously the key issue for American voters in 1940 was uh, America's likely response to uh, the war in Europe. Roosevelt had already stretched um, the Constitution to breaking point uh, to uh, arm Britain in as um, much as he already had done uh, in 1940, um, selling aircraft and some, uh, transferring surplus armaments, including uh, 50 destroyers in the Destroyers for Bases deal in the summer of 1940. The American electoral system is no respecter of crises. It works to a timetable, irrespective of whether there is a war or not. And the year of 1940 um, was scheduled to be uh, an election year, um, and Roosevelt had already uh, been in the office for two terms uh, from 1932 onwards. The summer of 1940 uh, was obviously the uh, crisis summer for the British, facing not just only Dunkirk, but the following Battle of Britain. And Roosevelt was a keen observer of the Battle of Britain, because in many ways he believed on that battle, not just Britain, but America's fate um, rested. If Britain fell and was invaded by the Nazis and a fascist puppet government was installed, then Europe would be one solid fascist, undemocratic bloc, and there would be um, very little that America could do about it. The challenges of invading a fortress Europe that included Britain as well, uh, and meant that the British Royal Navy had fallen into uh, fascist hands, would be immeasurably greater. So Roosevelt, thinking of the future, was very keen to um, do whatever he could to aid Britain, and the outcome of the election of um, the uh, winter of 1940, November 1940, and the Battle of Britain are kind of curiously tied. Uh, Whilst he was uh, spending his summer at Hyde Park um, agonising about uh, America's inward-looking isolationist tendencies, about the prospect of a British defeat in the Battle of Britain, Roosevelt also had to consider the fact that he stood, he was coming for re-election, and the fact that he had uh, already been in the office twice, um, the office of president twice, and this was a, a tradition set by George Washington, and uh, that there should uh, only ever be a two-term president. So actually. Uh, necessarily a constitutional stipulation, but it's certainly considered highly unusual if a president stands for more than two terms. Early in 1940, it appeared that Roosevelt would uh, step step down in 1940 and would retire uh, from the presidency. But it seems very much like the war was a deciding factor. He said to Henry Morgenthau, "Um, I do not wish to run. Um, unless between now and the convention, things get very, very much worse in Europe. Um, he'd planned to build a presidential library at his Hyde Park estate and had started to look to lucrative sidelines, as all presidents and prime ministers and leaders do upon uh, leaving office, um, writing a series of articles. Um, He was concerned mainly with his legacy, uh, again, as incumbent leaders tend to be. And, of course, by the summer of 1940, things have got significantly worse. And by the autumn of 1940, Britain is being bombed as the the Blitz has begun. The Republican Party may well have considered an isolationist candidate, uh, such as Robert Taft, for example, 
had it not been for the fall of France. Um, on the 24th of June, uh, which uh, was two days after France's surrender, um, delegates uh, decided to reject uh, party grandees uh, such as Taft and instead embraced a relative new, relatively unknown newcomer figure, uh, Wendell Wilkie, a far younger, untried and untested figure who had only joined the Republican Party in 1939, having come over from the Democrats. And Wilkie's a curious character, a mix of contradictions, uh, a political uh, and ambitious careerist who also took the time in the, from the 1920s onwards to campaign for civil rights. He was a vehement opponent of the Ku Klux Klan and later after the war uh, resumed civil rights activism. But at the same time, he'd emerged in the later 1930s as a key opponent of the New Deal, representing the business community that saw the New Deal as a threat to their activities. And yet again, at the same time, he was not a proponent of laissez-faire economics and generally supported most of the progressive uh, social reforms of the New Deal. Um, so uh, a man of contradictions... And his nomination did not go without uh, comment from the rank and file of the party. The former Indiana Republican Senator James E. Watson said, If a whore repented and wanted to join the church, I'd personally welcome her and lead her up the aisle to a pew. But by the eternal, I'd not ask her to lead the choir the first night. This quote, by the way, comes from uh, David Kennedy's Excellent History of America, 1929-45, Freedom from Fear, um, part of the Oxford History of the United States, and the pre-runner to uh, Grand Expectations, which we've been looking at quite a lot recently as well. Wilkie was a tool above all else within the Republican Party to contain the isolationists. Um, he'd spoken out against the Nazis, um, he had spoken in favour of repealing the arms embargo um, uh, against uh, all uh, against Great Britain, um, and he appealed to the Republicans or the uh, Eastern Coast Republicans, who were generally kind of Anglophilic in their outlook, who wanted to hold the isolationists back. Wilkie won the nomination in Philadelphia uh, on the sixth ballot, and his running mate was uh, Charles McNary, uh, the Oregon senator, who had all sorts of curious ideological differences with Wilkie. One of the chief objections that Wilkie had to the New Deal was the Tennessee Valley Authority and the kind of the nationalisation of power as he saw it, at the generation of electricity. Um, and McNary was a keen proponent of the TVA and thought that these sorts of schemes should be expanded. In July 1940, Roosevelt um, attended the Democrat convention in Chicago. Uh, Chicago was a Democrat safe city. Um, the mayor of uh, Chicago, Edward Kelly, was capable, was the, the Democratic uh, boss, party boss, and was capable of filling the convention with Roosevelt supporters. And here we see uh, part of the, uh, the fine art of political theatre. Roosevelt couldn't be seen to go to the conference and simply say um, that he was standing for a third term. It needed to appear to come from the delegates. And so there was no um, way that he could let on before uh, the convention, um, that this was what his intention was. Instead, he had to keep his best poker face and um, have the uh, minders and workers within the party, uh, particularly Kelly, help him to engineer the situation. There were um, pro-Roosevelt protestations of loyalty and demonstrations from the floor, and the... Um, loudspeakers boomed the chant, we want Roosevelt. Roosevelt appear, had to appear to be kind of slightly magnanimous and um, open to challenge and say that democracy must prevail and that the 
Uh, delegates must be allowed to vote for whoever they want. Uh, but the reality was that um, the whole uh, the whole convention uh, was designed to get Roosevelt's uh, endorsement for a third term. And this appears largely, as we previously mentioned, uh, to be based around Roosevelt's anxieties about the world situation and his belief that he was best suited to um, lead America through whatever crisis in Europe uh, was, which was currently unfolding. Whatever Roosevelt did, it worked. He was nominated and his running mate was Henry Wallace, the Agriculture Secretary, um, who had been a progressive Republican who had registered as a Democrat only in 1936. So some interesting crossovers happening, Wilkie on one side, Wallace on the other. It was Wallace's Republican past that would um, see him uh, marginalised gradually and replaced by uh, Harry Truman, as vice president from 1944 onwards, and the uh, and um, ensured that he had no chance of inheriting the top job or when Roosevelt died. The anger of the delegates was uh, clear. Not only the fact that a Republican, a former Republican, had been given the role of being Roosevelt's running mate, but also the fact that part of the kind of the reactionary old guard of the Democrat Party that then really accepted the New Deal um, were uh, resentful uh, that Wallace, who was actually quite a social liberal had, and who had uh, embraced all aspects of the New Deal, was now going to be the uh, vice president um, to, to Roosevelt, um, if should Roosevelt be elected. And this showed that there was, within the Democrat Party, quite an ideological chasm that had widened immensely as a result of the New Deal. Um, the New Deal itself was not entirely accepted within the Democrat Party at all. And these uh, ideological uh, divisions would continue after the war and find their kind of um, apogee under uh, Lyndon Johnson, and the uh, Great Society and the end of Johnson's idealism by about 1968 uh, was uh, the kind of the death knell uh, or the beginnings of the end for uh, the liberal wing of the Republican Party. Um, I did a podcast on Johnson uh, some years ago now anyway. Um, look through the list and you'll be able to find it. And we'll talk about the kind of the, the crisis years for Johnson, 64 to 68. Roosevelt had served under Woodrow Wilson during the First World War as the Assistant Navy Secretary. And he was well aware, <coughs> excuse my cough by the way, I do apologise. He was well aware of the uh, tragedy of Woodrow Wilson, who had been undermined by partisanship, by partisanship, um, and the uh, fate of the Treaty of Versailles and the League of Nations um, that had been strangled by uh, various um, uh, isolationist wings of the Republican Party and certain isolationist voice in the Democrats as well. With this in mind, just before the Republican convention, Roosevelt named um, two prominent Republicans um, to be part of his cabinet. Um, Frank Knox uh, became the Secretary of the Navy and Henry Stimson became the Secretary of War and would serve as the Secretary of War throughout the Second World War. And in doing so, he managed to undermine, possibly fatally, Wendell Wilkie before Wilkie's campaign had even begun. It showed that Roosevelt was keen to present a united front during a time of crisis and the threat of war, and that uh, a bipartisan consensus was being sought, uh, but it was also a very cunning bit of politics. Here is how the New York Herald Tribune reported it. Not since that titanic conservative Alexander Hamilton handed the election of 1800 to his hated rival, the liberal Jefferson, to save and unite the nation in a time of crisis, has a political leader of America made a more magnanimous and wholehearted gesture. Roosevelt knew 
that the Republicans would be um, divided over the issue of aid to uh, Great Britain if there were uh, Republicans in the cabinet who were internationalists who had an outlook of help to um, Great Britain the isolationists within the Republican Party would become uh, divided and isolated and their uh, power over the Republican Party itself would be weakened and the hand of the Republican candidate for the presidency would also be diminished as well. And so Wilkie started the uh, presidential campaign with a number of key handicaps. Foreign policy itself becomes a non-issue during the uh, election because both candidates are internationalists. Wilkie shares mainly uh, the majority of um, Roosevelt's views. The problem for Wilkie is that he's untested and inexperienced in oratory. Um, he makes all sorts of off-the-cuff comments when he is at the microphone, saying some quite daft things periodically, and he is far less polished a political performer than Roosevelt. One potential threat to Roosevelt was the Burke Wadsworth Selective Service Bill. This was a bill, a bipartisan bill, that was making its way through Congress that was the f essentially the first peacetime draft in American history. George Marshall wanted a complete mobilization, a far-reaching draft that would prepare uh, America for war anywhere in the world. However, uh, Roosevelt was still in the short-of-war phase of thinking and didn't want to make any moves that could be interpreted uh, as de facto acts of war, such as uh, full mobilizations of the US Army and uh, US manpower. The bill presented Roosevelt with significant difficulties. All men of service age who were drafted would face one year of compulsory military service, but there would be a ban on deploying them outside the Western Hemisphere. Um, thus keeping with the kind of traditions of the Monroe Doctrine. Um, the bill would present the first peacetime draft in US history and would no doubt among large sections of the population be highly unpopular, not just because there were young men unwilling to serve and not wanting to have their civilian lives disrupted, but also because it presented the fear of all-out war and a break with isolation uh, to an American population that was still highly sceptical prior to Pearl Harbor. A limited draft, uh, Roosevelt told one uh, reporter, may easily defeat the Democratic national ticket. Wilkie, on the other hand, seemed to have quite a lot of integrity on this particular subject. Um, a reporter asked Wilkie uh, that if you want to win the election, you'll have to come out against the proposed draft, or put it to Wilkie like that. Uh, Wilkie responded, I would rather not win the election than do that. In a campaign speech, Wilkie said, Selective service is the only democratic way in which to assure the trained and competent manpower we need in our national defence. And as the bill passed uh, in mid-October 1940, 16 million men between the ages of 21 and 35 registered on the draft rolls. The issue of the transfer or the proposed transfer of destroyers from America to Great Britain also uh, came up as a key electoral issue. In August, Roosevelt hit upon a deal which would uh, appear give him the veneer of being uh, getting the better side of the bargain. Um, he um, agreed with Churchill, or proposed to Churchill, that the gift of the warships would come with the exchange into American hands of British, of British bases in Bermuda and Newfoundland, and 99-year leases on British bases in the West Indies. So in this uh, sense, the Destroyers for Bases deal could be seen as a, a good deal for America, because it uh, enhanced American defences in the Western Hemisphere, exactly the sort of things that would appeal to the electorate in 1940.
um, this actually played into isolationist hands quite nicely uh, and appealed to isolationist sensibilities. And it also sidestepped uh, the laws pro uh, prohibiting uh, the gifting of military equipment to another power, as now this was part of a very different kind of transaction. And this also put the heat on Wendell Wilkie. He was forced uh, to give the deal his blessing, but in doing so, uh, giving the deal his blessing would also harm his electoral chances. It will show that uh, Roosevelt was making decisions in uh, the defence of the United States, not something that really on the campaign you want to be endorsing against your opponent. For his part, Roosevelt uh, thought that if Congress rejected the deal, and if Congress suspected that it was really just a ruse for him to break the laws around uh, equipping foreign powers, then he might well be impeached for this. And it was something that Roosevelt eventually, on September the 2nd, ignored Congress completely on and uh, authorised the deal on his own executive authority. Never mind the fact that the destroyers in question were old World War I tugs and of uh, little practical use and actually far more of a liability to the Royal Navy than they were assets, um, the ships were a symbolic gesture of support from the United States and designed to send a clear political message from, from uh, Great Britain to Germany. It was at this point, that, following the executive uh, order, that Wilkie began to attack the president, calling it the most arbitrary and dictatorial action ever taken by a president in the history of the United States. As Wilkie's campaign uh, started to hit the doldrums, the influence of the isolationists began to creep back, and the power of the isolationists in the Republican Party over Wilkie grew, and he began to use the rhetoric of warmonger to describe Roosevelt. Uh, we do not send our boys over there again, he said in a speech in St. Louis. If you, if you elect the third term candidate, I believe they will be sent. The uh, aviator and Nazi sympathiser Charles Lindbergh uh, parroted the same sorts of ideas in speeches on behalf of Wilkie. And in desperation, it prompted Roosevelt to uh, a fateful promise that he knew he couldn't keep. I have said this before, and I shall say it again. Your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. Probably, Wilkie never really stood a chance. Probably, Roosevelt, without any rash promises, had won anyway. Um, however, it did seem that the pledge against uh, waging war went in Roosevelt's favour, um, however hollow that promise was. Polls tended to show that had there been um, no war, that Wilkie would probably have won the election. But the fact that there was meant that the incumbent candidate had everything in his favour, um, the... Uh, sense of disillusionment over aspects of the New Deal which hadn't fulfilled many of the expectations of voters fueled this um, apathy for Roosevelt. But the belief that um, a more experienced and more established political leader was necessary uh, to be around at the time of the national crisis uh, definitely played to his strengths. Wilkie did well in uh, only 10 states um, these are all Republican strongholds anyway, uh, Maine and Vermont uh, and the Midwest. Um, Roosevelt's margin of victory was the slimmest of the three elections that he had so far fought. One of Roosevelt's key campaign messages was that war was good for business. Um, when he visited uh, Boston, uh, he said, you know, you good people here in Boston know of the enormous increase in productive work at your Boston Navy Yard. Uh, in Seattle, he said, citizens of Seattle, you've watched the Boeing plant out there grow. Across the country, he was uh, making similar sorts of statements. These foreign orders mean prosperity in this country, and we can't elect a Democratic Party unless we get prosperity. And these foreign orders are of the greatest importance. 
And it was this war production that finally brought America out of the Great Depression. 3.5 million workers um, had uh, been taken on out of um, the dark days of, of the um, late, later Depression, 1937-38. And unemployment at the end of 1940 had gone down to 14.6% which was its lowest level in a decade. To which Churchill dryly put later on that the Americans were very good in applauding the valiant deeds done by others. OK, well, guys, I'm going to leave it there. Um, thanks very much for listening, and I'll catch you on the next podcast. Do pop by the Facebook page and say hi. I've been having some great conversations there recently. And also, you can check us out on iTunes, uh, pop by and give us a good review, a good thumbs up. It's always good for business. Anyway, thanks very much. All the best. Bye-bye.